Right, a couple of people are missing, but uh, we'll make a start. I'm sure they'll catch up. Let's just quickly begin by reviewing where we've got to uh, so far. Uh, we did a basic introduction on Monday, looked at the first simple operating system yesterday, uh, and began to consider some issues such as how we can uh, run sequences of tasks from a scheduled system, and we looked at MISRA C uh, as a set of coding guidelines which can help you to produce better systems using C. Uh, what we're going to do today, what we've done in the last couple of days, is we worked with 8-bit microcontrollers. Uh, there's nothing wrong with 8-bit microcontrollers. We're uh, working on one project at the moment which involves an 8-bit microcontroller for an large organization. They're still used, um, but 32-bit devices are much more common. Uh, and what we're going to have a look at today is the implications of this. What do you think are the major, why do you think people are moving from 8-bit to 32-bit? Okay. Cost. Much the same by now. Um, you get you get a 32-bit microcontroller for about one US dollar. Um, they're not expensive devices. Often you have to pay more for some of the older 8-bit devices than you'd have to pay for a modern 32-bit device. One of the key differences, though, nothing to do with performance, memory. Many embedded systems are not actually really pushing the edges of the performance that you get from the processor. Key factor, uh, debug support. The fact that 32-bit microcontrollers have a JTAG interface makes a huge difference to when you're debugging the system. And we'll look at that a little bit later on. There are 8-bit devices that have such an interface, but most don't. So the way that you were doing your debugging in the last few days was you were working in a simulator. If you'd been using a standard 8051, you'd have done things like you'd have debugged through the serial port, or you'd have monitored port pins to check task execution times, etc. You don't generally have to do that with a 32-bit device. You'll do, take a lot of control and do, get a lot of the crucial data you need through the debug interface. And we'll start doing that today. So this is the key bit, debugging with JTAG. We're going to talk about a multitask TTC scheduler, so a slight change to the scheduling uh, process. And we'll also talk about two other platforms. So really today we're going to talk about the three most popular platforms for modern embedded systems. 32-bit off-the-shelf microcontrollers x86 platforms, so embedded PCs, uh, and FPGA platforms um, as solutions. We're not going to do any of these uh, in enormous detail, but we're going to look at and compare the different platforms and give you a feel for what's available. So let's start with a question. Suppose you were to compare 1,000 embedded systems. 500 based on 8-bit devices, 500 based on 32-bit devices. Uh, given that vague spec, which would you expect to be more reliable? Sorry? Yep. I think uh, so, that, and that may be the case. Anybody else? Any factors do you think that might make a difference uh, in producing these systems? I don't know what JTAG does, but maybe with that extra feedback, to make it more reliable or something. Maybe okay. That feedback has to go on. One of the, and one of the big differences is some of the things, uh, we, we talked yesterday about transmitting data over an RS-232 link. And with the, with the 8051 microcontroller, you had a one-byte hardware buffer in the device, so you, you copy data that one-byte buffer. On the 32-bit designs that we'll look at today, and quite typically, there's a 16-byte hardware buffer. So in fact, the software complexity can be reduced. The timers in 32-bit devices are infinitely more sophisticated, and to create a one-second delay requires exactly the same amount of code as creating a 10-millisecond delay 
than 8051. Whereas in 8051, you had more work to do to do some of the features. So in some cases, using these platforms with enhanced hardware support, let alone the debug support, you can sometimes reduce the software complexity. Uh, and that, in turn, one of the few things we know is if there are two planes on the runway, both have passed all the certification tests. One has a thousand lines of code in it, one has a million lines of code in it. Which one do you want to fly? A thousand lines of code every time. And the only thing we know, uh, uh, we've not been doing software development for very long in human history. The only thing we know is basically every time you add an additional line of code, you increase the opportunity to have additional bugs in the system. So you want to keep the code as short as possible as long as you meet the spec as a general rule. Uh, and sometimes use of these more sophisticated modern hardware platforms can help you to achieve that. So let's just begin by looking at some of the timing factors that are important as we start to pull these systems together. So we know what a real-time system is. The timing, uh, uh, the time at which results are generated can be as important as the fact that the results are generated correctly. One of the things we asked you to look at yesterday was jitter. Variations in, typically at the simplest level, variations in the start time of a task. So if there was no jitter in this design and these uh, upward arrows represented interrupts, the tasks would start exactly the same amount of time after the interrupt in each case. And there would be no jitter in the task timings, in the timings of the start of the task. We might have situations where we're doing an analog to digital sample in the middle of a task, and then we have to take some other actions because just because the task starts at precisely the right time uh, has no impact. What might, what might cause jitter in the start times? We're using a scheduler, we assume, something like SEOS that we used yesterday. What's the kind of things that would cause variations between that and that? Okay. Okay, so why? What is it that determines that, uh, that might determine how quickly a task... Well, that, that's, we're assuming that these timings are precisely right. So the interrupts occur at exactly the right times, uh, we're assuming, uh, in this case. And we, so we assume those are perfect, but there's some variation here. What might cause that? Okay, so there's a delay between the interrupt happening here and the task being called. So that could happen if you've got a switch statement in there that's determining, or you've got a whole bundle of if x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 2, then run this task. If a is equal to b, et cetera, et cetera, run this task. If there's a bundle of complicated conditions, and sometimes you have to go through that complicated code before you call the task, and sometimes you don't, you're going to get jitter. Now that level of jitter uh, a level of jitter can be significant, and this is why. So we touched on this briefly before. This slightly more formally uh, is where, what, why the jitter has an impact. Suppose you're sampling a signal uh, in any kind of application, and suppose, um, suppose you're sampling a 500 hertz tone and you're using an 8-bit analog to digital converter. So this is nothing like the kind of quality you'd expect to get from an MP3 player. It's very low end of the spectrum. So uh, you might expect to be sampling about 32K, 16 bits uh, for typical music system. This is way down the range from that. So it's low end, 8-bit analog to digital converter, 500 hertz tone. 
and you're supposed to be sampling here. But because of jitter, you sample a little bit later. And because of that, rather than sampling zero, you sample this. Uh, you get this input. And the input fact of that, this is coming off the edge of the screen, by the time we get to one microsecond of jitter, we start losing data in this sampled data application. So by the time we get to one microsecond of jitter, this has become a 7-bit ADC. Uh, as we increase that level, it becomes a 6-bit ADC, etc., and we get a reduced signal-to-noise ratio. So even in this kind of application, uh, with a very low re uh, resolution ADC and a low frequency that we're sampling, we're already beginning to lose data at a one microsecond jitter level. That's quite a fine timing requirement uh, for these systems. That applies whether you're sampling the data or on the output of the system if you're doing a control application as well. So your challenge typically in many of the systems that you're asked to produce for hard real-time systems is often timing resolutions, guaranteeing timing resolutions at around about the microsecond level is not an uncommon requirement. That's quite tight to obtain. So sometimes, if, if we take care, we can, uh, we can get the timing of the start of the tasks right. If we're doing something like an A to D sample in the middle of a task, we may need to balance the code before that ADC sample. So we might need to use something like a sandwich delay or something to ensure that using our scheduler or our operating system, we can often guarantee the task, time, task start times, but we'll then have to implement the task correctly if time-sensitive activities happen later in the task. We have to make sure that the time taken to get to that point in the task is always the same. So let, we'll come back to where these timing requirements come from uh, over the course of this morning session. This can be seen as a very brief history of where embedded systems have come from. Uh, starting off with discrete circuits, build your own hardware to match the needs of the application, uh, evolving into 8-bit uh, microcontrollers, and now into 32-bit microcontroller designs. Some people argue that this is the future way these things are going. 8-bit to 32-bit to FPGAs. Everything on an FPGA. Why select one of these, uh, somewhere on here, one of these microcontrollers uh, for your system when you could custom build an appropriate microcontroller that matched the precise needs of your application. And that's the kind of opportunity we have with uh, FPGAs. Yes. So you can, you can configure if you've got time to do so, come back in September. Uh, and you take an FPGA, you can configure it using VHDL to implement a microcontroller. Uh, if you're, suppose your microcontroller, for whatever reason, requires eight UART interfaces, for eight serial interfaces to be used for RS-232 or RS-485. You look in the catalog, you can't find one. You can create an FPGA, a microcontroller, with exactly that requirement meeting that, exactly that requirement on that one FPGA uh, to meet the needs of your application. Next time, you need 10 UARTs, you need additional memory, you need pulse width modulation, you need CAN support, you need 16 CAN channels, you need LIN channels, whatever you need for, to meet the needs of your application, you put on there. Suppose your application does digital signal processing type activities. So you look at it, what's the part of your application that's consuming most uh, CPU capacity? Maybe it's doing fast Fourier transforms. Why are you doing that in software? Create a fast Fourier transform block in hardware, put it on your FPGA, call that. It's just like a mass coprocessor. Uh, if you do floating point operations, um, you don't want to use a processor that doesn't have hardware floating point support. Use a, uh, add hardware floating supp point support onto your FPGA and implement it in that way. That's the options that are now available to you. Drawbacks typically power consumption and cost. Um, these guys are still more power hungry. 
and they're still more expensive. Getting much more competitive in both respects, uh, and people have been saying for a number of years, this is going to happen. Hasn't happened fully yet, but it's happening much more. Except when you add them on here, you're, the FPGA is just a bundle of logic gates that you configure to do a particular job. So if I add additional hardware components on here, I need a bigger PCB, I solder more components on, I wire them up. So I've got the complexity of that. Uh, in here, all I'd be doing is I would be saying, OK, there are bits of the FPGA I haven't used yet. I'm going to configure those spare gates to do this job. One of the reasons the space that these things end up in satellite systems by now is another neat characteristic. Suppose you take your additional peripherals and add them onto this board and put it up in space. Then you decide six months later that in fact you need an extra UART or a GPS interface or whatever else. What you can do with this is you can reconfigure it in space to make it do the job that you want to do now. And sometimes people even reconfigure these Normally, during the program operation, um, at this part of the program, we need an FFT. Configure the, configure the uh, uh, FPGA to give me an FFT capability when I need it now, then get rid of that and use it for some other hardware component later on in the operation. It's a, uh, it opens up a bundle of interesting possibilities. Main significant advantage of working in this device is this has one, well, there are a number of things. This is essentially one CPU that does things sequentially. When you start working at this level, it's parallel processing. And that might be parallel pro um, peripherals working in parallel, or it, uh, and it could equally well be multiple cores. They're each interface to your own set of peripherals. It adds an enormous level of flexibility to the way we put these things together. So let's, let's start with We'll look briefly at FPGAs here. Let's start with a uh, um, currently more common 32-bit microcontroller platform. So this, we looked at this a couple of days ago. This is a minimal circuit for making something operate with an 8051. People sometimes think, OK, I'm going to use a 32-bit microcontroller. The world's going to be much more complicated. This is a complete circuit for a 32-bit microcontroller. It's not significantly more complicated. Um, there's a little bit more going on here, but not very much. And this one includes uh, our LED that we can flash in this case. And that's the main additional bit of circuitry here. Uh, one of the things about this device is that it has a separate CPU power supply. That's quite neat. Some, uh, some of you were talking about how you can reduce the power consumption on systems. Suppose you've got a system that um, runs tasks like this. And sometimes task A runs, and then there's a long period before anything else is going to run in the system. So we've said, OK, put the processor in idle mode. But we can do better than that. Uh, I used to do quite a lot of running. Uh, if you do run it, running training, I think the process is called fartlek. You run very fast, and then you slow down. You run very fast, and you slow down. It's absolutely exhausting. Uh, you burn a lot of calories, and you get fit quite quickly. That's pretty much what we're doing here. We're running this at full tilt, and we're running it, and then we're essentially turning the processor largely off. Another option is... reduce the frequency and run the processor a bit more slowly so that it, so the task completes in that time. On its own, that doesn't help us. But when we run the processor at lower frequency, we can also drop the operating voltage for the core at the same time. And this is a process called dynamic voltage scaling, where you can reduce the operating voltage of the core you can only do that if you've got a separate core power supply, because if you start reducing the operating voltage of the whole processor, you'll drop the, pro the uh, 
uh, pin voltages, and you might have you might disrupt the hardware behavior, external hardware behavior. So you need a separate supply for the core. If you've got that, you can do this, and you get uh, a voltage squared saving um, in uh, power consumption, voltage or frequency, whatever, I can't remember which way around it is. You get a significant saving in power consumption from this compared with this, and it's really quite a significant saving. Uh, that will really save you time. Again, will save you power. Again, you can only do this in a situation where you know when the next task is going to run. Because if you don't know that, you can't work out how much you can drop the voltage by, etc., to complete the task in the right time. Um, but that's just one of the, again, side effects of this. Sometimes people think, if I'm going from 8-bit to 32-bit, naturally it's going to consume more power. That's not the case. These guys are often pretty well optimized. And you may have other options like DVS, dynamic voltage scaling, etc., that you can begin to employ in these circumstances. Just going to quickly run you through um, some of the features of an example modern 32-bit microcontroller. It's produced by NXP. I have no uh, connection to NSP. I'm not trying to sell you a processor. Uh, it's just a typical example. So this one runs an ARM7 uh, core. Uh, do you know about ARM? Yep. UK-based company. They don't manufacture, they have no fabrication plants, they do chip designs. If you've got a mobile phone, you've probably got one of those processors in your pocket, uh, one of those processor designs in your pocket. Uh, this is typical of this uh, kind of system. This is a modern 8051. If you look at the spec, it's not really very different from what we looked at. So it's got a core, of course. It's got rather more flash and RAM than we saw in our 8051. Uh, it's got... Uh, lots of I.O., but it's basically got I.O. pins, some timers, uh, and a serial interface, including an RS2 in interface and some CAN support, which we'll talk about in a little while, and we'll talk about in more detail tomorrow. It's not really very different in terms of the spec from the 8051. It's got the same core components. It just does them in a slightly more uh, comprehensive way this time. And it's got support for testing and debugging with a JTAG interface, which we'll talk about a little bit further later. Uh, it's got a four gigabyte address space. <laughs> so it's a, um, seriously, uh, you can add uh, really significant amounts of additional memory on these devices if you want to. Members of this family, like the 8051, there are different members of this family. Some of them don't have support for external memory. Some of them do have support for external memory. So if you needed a lot of memory on a device, you could do that through these kind of systems. Uh, there's a complicated set of interrupt handling that deals with all sorts of different levels of interrupts. That's not going to matter to us because we're still going to be using a single interrupt on uh, these designs. But there's a sophisticated uh, interrupt handling here for dealing with different uh, interrupt levels. Uh, much more advanced GPIO connections on this. You can configure the GPIO pins in a number of different ways on this device, uh, control the direction of individual port pins, etc. It's much more sophisticated than you had on the 8051. We'll provide you with some code libraries. The, the, the downside of this level of flexibility is that the coding is inevitably more challenging. And we'll give you some code libraries that deal with some of these things. Um, it's got a built-in analog to digital converter, which is uh, useful. Uh, it's 10-bit A to D converter. The conversion time is pretty respectable at a couple of microseconds to do a conversion. That's quite fast. Uh, one of the ways in which we can use this is to do things like um, measuring uh, angles uh, in uh, x squared like this, uh, central heating temperature, humidity levels, etc. One way that these are sometimes used, more simply, is something like this. Uh, so basically, uh, take a 5 volt input, put some kind of potentiometer on it, and get, uh, read that input into an ADC uh, port on your system. Quite commonly used as a simple way of getting an analog input into the system. If you've got a built in ADC, it's quite cheap. You're building a high reliability design. I give you the option of doing this, 
are the option of using an LCD display and two buttons up and down. Which one do you want? Yep. If cost is no object, you're going to go with the LCD. You've got finer level of control, particularly, again, if the nuclear reactor goes offline, the temperature here can start flashing, and this can reflect the real temperature. This, unless you put a little motor on it, can't be adjusted to reflect what's currently happening in the system. So this is cheap uh, and maybe adequate if it is just a heating system. If it's anything to do with reliability, then something a little bit more sophisticated uh, is like to be better. It's like to leave you in control. Uh, there's a digital to analog converter, which allows you to do speech playback. Uh, typically, kind of things, vehicle reversing. Vehicle reversing uh, is not an uncommon use for that. Not many devices have a DAC in them these days. Uh, they've got a pulse width modulated output in them, a PWM output. Have you used PWM? Um, possibly in an earlier module. This is what PWM means. Uh, if we didn't have light bulbs like this, if I was able to stand at the corner of the room and flick the light switch on and off at high frequency, so it was on for 50% of the time, off for 50% of the time, the lights would dim. If I left them on for a bit longer and off for a bit less, they'd be brighter. If I left them on for a very short period of time and then off for a long period of time, the uh, lights would, uh, would get dimmer, brighter or dimmer. That's how we control it. You can do speech playback with this. Uh, approach quite comfortable. You get quite decent quality speech playback even on one of these little 7-bit microcontrollers uh, using a PWM output. You need to choose this period or one over this period, the frequency at which you update the um, PWM responses. So if you do that very slowly and you're controlling the lights or something, you'll see visible flicker. So you typically want to do this pretty quickly. Typically, you want to do it uh, somewhere above 20 kilohertz. Why? Uh, it's related to speech playback, but it's not, even if you're not doing speech playback, even if you're using this to control a motor or something, you will want to do it at typically above 20 kilohertz. Why? Um, the, the switch, so you, whatever you do, whether you do this in software or whether you configure the hardware to do it, you want to make sure that the frequency at which the, the signal is updated um, the P, the, so 1 over the PWM period that's shown on the diagram, you want to make sure that 1 over the PWM period is greater than 20 kilohertz. No, nothing to do with the jitter, no. It's to do with your, uh, with your customers. Human auditory range goes up to 20K. If you do your PWM signals at around about 10K or less, your customers will hear it. Quite often, they will hear it. They'll hear a buzz or some really infuriating whine coming out of your system. Take that up. Uh, if you've got sympathy for your dog or some of your customers might be using a home where there are dogs or cats, you need to take it above, 20, above 50 kilohertz or uh, they will hear it. Uh, and you'll drive people insane because the dogs will start barking when this goes on, etc. So you need to pull it up. Typically, this frequency needs to be quite high. Uh, you can do this, as shown here, you can actually do PWM in software, but unless you can get the frequencies up, it, it's often not a good idea. Uh, this allows six single-edge PWM outputs, this microcontroller. Why? 
Brushless DC motor control. That's what the PWM outputs are on here for. Brushless motor control uh, is a common application of these things. Why do you use a brushless motor rather than a brushed motor? Much faster speeds, lower maintenance costs, longer operating life, less noise. Uh, it's a good choice in many cases. Great choice if you're in the embedded systems domain because every one of those brushless motors needs some kind of embedded controller in there to do the work. And once you've got that in there, you start doing other things with the embedded controller. But that's typically why these things are PWM support so that you can hook them onto a brushless motor. Virtual, and you can tell how, how common that demand is just by looking at the spec of modern uh, microcontrollers. Virtually everyone has this support built in. There are lots of serial interfaces on this. Um, um, Ethernet access, USB, uh, we're not gonna do anything with either of those on this module. Four UARTs, four UARTs. RS-232 is surely dead. This doesn't have it, your, process, your uh, laptop probably don't have it. This pretty modern microcontroller still has four um, RS-232 compatible connections. To allow you to do RS-232 and to allow you to stick it in a factory where they're quite likely to still be using something based on RS-485, uh, serial communication protocol, multi-drop, uh, up to 10 megabits per second, quite widely used in factory settings still. It's basically a UART-based protocol. Uh, CAN, introduced first in the automotive sector, and uh, now very widely used, another serial protocol used in factories, medical systems, automotive, space, you name it. Uh, vast number of things using CAN. We'll touch on CAN briefly this morning and talk about CAN in more detail tomorrow. And there are various other ones, SPI, I squared C, etc. These things are all, all come by now with hardware support for all of these different interfaces. You might use your I squared C, you might use your SPI, I think that's the way it's used on the boards that you'll be using later in this module to talk to an LCD display. Uh, you might use I squared C to talk to a serial memory device store parameters, et cetera, for your application. So these are all standard protocols that are used to allow you to hook up additional peripherals onto this should you wish to do so uh, for your application. Um, this is just summary of what the UART does. So it's got a 16-byte 16, 16 uh, first in, first out buffers, both transmit and receive buffers, which simplifies the software load here. You've got a fraction, what's known as a fractional baud rate generator. What that means is, essentially, the baud rate control is independent of the timers in your application, essentially. And you can have virtually any baud rate and does no impact on the tick rate you can use in your scheduler. If you do nothing else about switching between microcontroller families, the timers and the timer flexibility in here is uh, impressive. Uh, CAN controller we'll talk about. So this CAN gives you up to one megabit per second, uh, comparatively long messages, uh, easy to use, uh, and a great way of building distributed systems. We'll talk about these tomorrow. Um, the timers. Timers in these devices are impressive too. Suppose you're building a system which is going to be a TTC design, so time trigger cooperative. And the task lengths vary. So this task is say 10 milliseconds, and this one's two milliseconds, and this one's three milliseconds. And you want to run them like this with no jitter in the start times. What we looked at yesterday was we said, okay, we set the scheduler up and it's got a 10 millisecond tick. And that's how we run it. But you don't always want that. Sometimes you basically want to start each task in its own tick, regardless of how long the task is. And this kind of timers allow you to do that really quite easily. So you can set, so you can have the system, it's still running all the tasks at a known point in time, but the ticks themselves that are driving this are not necessarily periodic. That can be very flexible when you're putting your system together. Um, so it's useful. These things come 
for free in the way that these uh, timers are set up. Very briefly, before we look at uh, the, the software implications, a little bit about the FPGA architecture. So we said, I think I've probably said most of this earlier, um, some people argue this is the next step in these developments. Uh, and you can add uh, any number of different peripherals, etc., to your design. This is a major driver for FPGAs. If you work in the aerospace or defense sectors, then your product life can be up to 50 years. If you go in uh, and you try and buy uh, a microcontroller that's produced today, in five years' time, you'll have difficulty. In 10 years' time, you probably won't be able to buy it. Uh, you better buy something similar, but not the one you actually designed your processor for. One of the reasons that uh, defense uh, and aerospace sectors in particular like FPGAs is they have the complete um, configuration files, the VHDL files which are used to configure the FPGA and they know that in 50 years time they won't be able to buy the same FPGA hardware but they equally they are 99% sure that they will be able to buy an FPGA which they will be able to configure using these files. And that is very reassuring, because uh, it gives you a way of future-proofing your designs. And that's quite an attractive way of working here. So it means that, in some ways, it allows you to second, it, it gives you more opportunities. If you're building your design based on an NXP microcontroller, for example, suppose NXP goes bust. People like to have a second source for key parts in the system. Sometimes that's challenging to do. But if, you've got, if you build your system around an FPGA platform and you've got the VHDL source, there are three or four large FPGA manufacturers. If you base it on a Xilinx FPGA and something catastrophic happens and Xilinx didn't exist in a few years' time, you could probably find an Altera FPGA that you could make this work on. And that kind of swapping um, is an attractive option. This is something uh, not to be sniffed at. If you want to ensure, if you go and buy an off-the-shelf microcontroller, you'll never know exactly what happens inside it. They simply won't give you all of that information, because if that information was available, the competitors could copy the design. If you build your own microcontroller, you will know exactly how it works. And if you know exactly how it works, it allows you to do things like do detailed predictions of the timing behavior, etc., uh, in your system, which would not otherwise be possible. And if you want control of the timing behavior and you want to certify your system, that, again, can be useful. Um, so this is what you'll... This is a soft microcontroller that we'll be using in the lab classes this afternoon, uh, which uh, has a number of features... Uh, which are common for a 32-bit microcontroller, runs on an FPGA, as you'll discover this afternoon, makes no difference to a large extent to you. The fact that that microcontroller is implemented as a soft microcontroller running on an FPGA, once you're using it, just feels like a standard microcontroller uh, in the way that it's used. So you'll have a complete configuration for that microcontroller. We'll give you an FPGA platform in the lab exercises today, and you'll be programming this microcontroller in C in the same way that we worked with the 32, with, with the 8-bit ones uh, on previous sessions. So these are field programmable gate arrays. Uh, we use some kind of memory device to store the configuration of the system. So we basically we have a set of gates. We decide how those gates are going to be connected up. We store that gate configuration in a block of memory. We load the, from the memory into the FPGA, load that configuration to the FPGA, and we've got a microcontroller, we've got an FFT calculation, we've got whatever we want implemented in that particular platform. This is how we configure an FPGA. This is all we're going to do on this module. This is uh, VHDL or Verilog. Uh, that's how we configure the hardware. What does it look like? 
just like a standard programming language. If we were working in Ada on this module, it would look even more familiar because it's very, very similar. Uh, so, yeah, uh, just looks like a programming language. Now, if you're working in the embedded sector, you have a software background, this is another big bonus because in reality, the hardware is disappearing. Um, it's all software in reality. You configure the FPGA, so you configure the hardware using what is, in effect, a programming language. Uh, and then you, if you want to, you program the hardware uh, using another programming language. Do you need those two steps? I don't think you do anymore. So the question is, really, we could configure the whole lot in C. We could configure the whole lot in VHDL. We could decide that we don't need the processor at all and we just specify the required behavior entirely in VHDL. There's a bundle of potential ways in which this might be developed over the course of the next few years. Uh, it may be that we end up with the programming languages, VHDL and C, all disappearing, and we do all the coding at a higher level using UML or something, and we don't really much care what the platform is. We rely on a tool set to do the configuration for us. Um, that may be where it all ends up. This is currently how we do things. There are three broad classes of FPGAs. So we've got to store the configuration for um, our system in some uh, form in the FPGA. We can store it in SRAM. Uh, so we have a flash module that stores the configuration externally. When we switch the device on, it copies that configuration from flash into, the RAM, into RAM in the FPGA and then we can treat the FPGA as a piece of hardware once that configuration has been loaded up. These are common, but the SRAM may be vulnerable to radiation effects, not generally used in passenger aircraft, for example. Even at the altitude you're flying at, five, seven miles above the ground in a passenger aircraft, that's enough to cause what are known as single event upsets, bit flips in memory, which means these devices don't operate uh, correctly. Flash FPGAs uh, are another option. So in this case, the configuration of the hardware is also is itself stored in flash. There's not a separate external flash device and RAM storing the configuration. Everything's stored in FPGAs, less vulnerable to radiation, uh, can be used in passenger aircraft, for example. There's one step up from that further. Um, Antifuse FP, FPGAs can only be programmed once, but they're, um, they have very high immunity to radiation. So they're not, they're essentially, you program them once, take on the configuration you want, and you can't then change that hardware configuration. Is that what's called hard red? These are, these are rad hard, yes. Red. Yeah. Uh, some of the other ones uh, also have claims for radiation hardness and they're getting better. But these are traditionally, this is what you would expect most of the time in places like ESA and sometimes NASA to be using in space-based systems. Usually not always. Um, has it a guess as to how much they cost a piece? US dollars. Has it a guess? Four times that. You can pay $60,000 a piece for one of these rad hard FPGAs. I think everybody should have to program one at least once in their life because I think it's character building. Because <laughs> yeah. if you get the configuration wrong, you're just left with a $60,000 piece of uh, plastic and a little bit of metal that uh, you're going to have to be a piece of jewelry or something. Yep. Uh, uh, well, maybe that's your maybe that's your microcontroller. So you uh, so that it, you'd need external memory, but you could configure that to be your microcontroller. Um, what would you then do with the memory? So we've sa said that the I've argued that the memory itself is vulnerable to radiation effects. So we've said, okay, so now our processor is not vulnerable to radiation effects, but we still got to add external memory. What do we do then? The solution is you, you triplicate, use triple memories. And it's triple modular redundancy approach. So 
every time you read from memory, you read from three distinct memory blocks. You do comparisons, uh, and you do, uh, if two agree and one doesn't agree, you take from that uh, block. It's the only way uh, that we've basically worked out as a planet uh, how to do these things. So we use uh, triple modular redundancy in the memory system, um, and you, have, you build into your microcontroller ways of automatically doing that processing so you don't have to do this manually in code. This is invisible to you. The correction effects are invisible to you. If you find a particular block of memory has been corrupted, you'll aim to refresh it with the contents from good blocks of memory or find another uh, way of restoring constant data, etc. It's not trivial building these kinds of uh, designs. Uh, so some of you glaze over when I talk about these radiation effects and single event upsets, etc. We're already, the, what's happening with the world is the feature size on chips is getting smaller and smaller. And we started to see effects that we only used to see here and in aircraft. We're now seeing them on trains that operate at high altitudes in Switzerland because they have, the, the feature size on the chips are getting smaller and the effects are starting to be noticed at ground level. And as, we get, as the feature size on chips gets smaller and smaller again over the next few years, having to deal with these effects may become something that we have to face up to uh, more generally. Um, Well, that's essentially what you'd have to do. I, I described a process whereby you could create the microcontroller and triplicate the memory. You could triplicate and you can triplicate the configuration files for the FPGA and use that and work in the same way with that. And that's how the world is going on to look at flash-based and even SRAM-based FPGAs in this context. But the, we don't... All we can do is put the stuff in a lead box or something uh, to actually uh, protect it from radiation. But these guys don't like putting things in large, heavy, two-inch thick lead boxes for obvious reasons because the launch costs just go um, through the window. Um, by now, some of, these, some of the satellites, they are a bare PCB. CubeSats. Yeah, CubeSats and smaller. They are essentially just a PCB with a solar panel on it. And they, they are basically chucked out into space at the launch. They're very, very small, lightweight things that are doing various kinds of monitoring, etc. So wrapping it up in a, uh, even putting one thin layer of metal around it is just not an option that anybody would consider. Uh, so you're, you're really looking at ways of trying to make uh, find practical solutions to this uh, to face these kind of challenges. Take, I mean, just take a step back from that. Suppose we've triplicated the memory in here either in the FPGA configuration or just in the memory used by the processor itself, what happens to the time? Um, you then got to carefully design the processor to make sure you're taking into account how long it takes to access data from memory, even in the event that the memory is damaged. Uh, so anyway, uh, first implications of a move from 8-bit to 32-bit platforms. We've got additional memory and CPU performance. So one implication, yesterday we were looking at systems based on an 8051 with half a MIP of uh, performance. Now we're looking at an ARM device for much the same money, which has about 50 MIPs performance. Uh, and the basic challenge we faced yesterday was how to ensure that we designed B so that it completed before the next tick. The brute force change between this and this means that the kind of designs that give us are the simplest way of achieving predictability, which are to just run the designs with single tick, no overlapping tasks, etc., they become easier to build um, simply by virtue of the fact that the processor platform is more powerful. And that's a significant uh, advantage. Sometimes what people have done is they've gone from this and said, okay, I can use a full real-time operating system because now I've got the spare capacity to do this. Uh, in almost all cases, uh, I would argue that's just a recipe for uh, reduced reliability. And the reasons for that we'll talk about tomorrow. Essentially tomorrow, the title of tomorrow's session is essentially why you shouldn't use a, a real-time operating system. Um, 
So let's, we've got a bit more power. How are we going to make these systems work correctly? So this was what the kind of things we did with the operating system yesterday. What was wrong with this architecture? First thing was we ended up with all of the code in a single ISR. And somebody using this program had to uh, edit the operating system in effect, which was bad news. Uh, difficult to maintain and reuse that code in that form, and that's bad news. There's no separation between the operating system and the task set. Key challenge, though, is what happens if a task overruns. So in, don't need to change the diagram, if that task doesn't finish then, but instead task A ran to there, what would happen in uh, SEOS, in the operating system you were using yesterday? So B and C will run here? Yeah. No. They won't. B and C will be ignored. In the system you looked at yesterday, uh, because while this timer ISR is running, this interrupt will happen, but, it, but you can only interrupt an ISR with an interrupt of greater priority. So in this case, the interrupt is exactly the same priority because we're still running in the ISR, so we'll lose that tick. We'll lose that tick. Suppose B is keeping track of elapsed time. Uh, we've lost a second or something other in the system, and it's not going to work correctly. It's not going to catch up. Maybe B and C are doing the preparations for the next time A runs. So next time A runs, it doesn't run correctly, etc. It's very difficult to ensure that that system is going to operate as required. So, let's look at a better solution. Uh, so this is taken out of the uh, PTTS book, which uh, we've told you how to find. Um, and that's uh, got a lot of examples on this. I'm going to look at the key features of this briefly. Let me start. Uh, the slide numbers disappeared off on this version. I'm not sure what slide I'm on. Somebody tell us which slide we're on. 47, thank you. Uh, right, yeah, 52. 52 is the one I'm looking for. So this is slide 52. This is the timer ISR for this new version of a schedule. What does it do? Okay, so we, let's, let's ignore that bit, let's ignore this bit, let's ignore this bit and treat that as the only thing that's really relevant uh, in this ap uh, application. We're storing an increased tick count, which makes sense. Much of the rest of this is used by elsewhere in the scheduler, which we'll worry about later. Essentially, we store the tick count. If this was SEOS that we looked at yesterday, what else would we be doing here? Running the tasks. So we don't run the tasks here. So all we do, that's all that happens in the ISR. And the crucial change we've made in this is there's another function that runs. Uh, and in main, 
in Maine, in the, oops, in Maine, in the while loop, we will call this function to dispatch the tasks. So what this does is it checks the tick count and then it goes through an array to determine whether uh, there's a task due to run. Let's go back a few slides to see where that array comes from. So we have an array here, which an array of all of the tasks in the system. Uh, and in each case, we store a pointer to the task. We store a delay in ticks until the task is next due to run. And um, we store the period of the task. So we've got a set of periodic tasks, and we're updating the number of ticks until the t each task is next due to run. Uh, and we're storing also the interval between task runs. So every time, so we have that information for each task. We go back to where we were in the schedule of dispatch task function. What this does is it goes through all of the tasks in the array. Um, What's it doing on that line? What's the assumption made on that line? Okay, so if there is a task at that location, it's assuming the task will not begin at address zero. So, it's a, so we set an address, so this is a pointer to the task point of the starting, and so it's the starting address of the task in memory, and we're assuming here, which is the way that most systems work, that um, a task itself will not start at an address of zero in memory. So if we've got a non-zero value here, that means there is a task at that location in the array. And then we do this simple calculation. We decrement the delay value for that task by one. So for each task, we store the number of ticks until it's next due to run. When we go around the dispatch task looks, we take one from that value. If it's zero, if the delay value is zero, then this task is now due to run, and we run it. Once we've run the task, if the task has a period which is not equal to zero, then we reset the delay value for that task back to the period for that task so it will run again in an appropriate number of ticks time. What does the dot Okay, so these, so we've got the, um, we have an array of, go back a couple of chunks here. We've got, uh, this is a user-defined type in using a struct in C. Um, yeah, it's, it's closer to a class and object in uh, C++. So we have an array of uh, variables of type S task T, and each of these variables has a parameter which will be represented by the dot. So the dot field gives us the pointer to the task, dot delay, for each element, we'd say dot delay, and that would be the delay value for that element in the array. Period, dot period would be the period value for that element in the array. So each element in the array stores a pointer to a task, a delay value, and a period, and we gain access to those um, using um, dot delay, dot period, etc. Um, no, it's a one-dimensional array, but each element of the array has these three parameters. So each element, each element of the array, it's an array of tasks, and each task has, uh, has, is uh, represented by the address in memory at which the task begins, the delay value, the number of ticks until the task is next due to run, uh, and the period of the task. Yes. That's, that's what's happening in the dispatch task function and various other places in this code. 
to add the tasks to the array, we have an add task function. So what will happen in here is x. So if we're running a function called x, then we just have the function name without any parameters as the name of the task we want to add. Then there are two other parameters that we need to provide. First one is the delay. And then the next one is the period in ticks. Does that make sense? So that's the period, and that's the delay. Does that make sense? So what am I saying for that task? What tick will it be the first time task X is run by the schedule? It could be 1,000. And then the next one? 1,030. So it will run the first time after 1,000 ticks, then it will keep running every 30 ticks after that. You might want to do this. The reason that you'd want to have this flexibility is, what, what's another way of viewing what that is? So these are all periodic tasks. Um, yep. Give me another word that you might be more used to hearing in a signal processing context or something like that. If these were signals, what might we be talking about here? It's a phase parameter. Okay? So we're adjusting. So we could say these are all like periodic signals that all start here and they have different timings. What we're saying here is we can change the starting point for these periodic signals. So the signals can start at different times. Why we would want to do that is, suppose suppose we've got three periodic tasks, A, B, and C. Each take nine milliseconds to run. Each must run every 10 milliseconds. We might want to run like that. They'll run quite happily. So this one runs, then in the next tick, this one runs, then in the next tick, this one runs. So they're out of phase. If we didn't adjust the phase and tried to run them all in the same tick, then we'd overflow the tick interval straight away. So one of the things we can do is adjust the offsets of the tasks, adjust the delay values to control the sequence of the tasks and to ensure that they run without breaching the uh, available tick interval. So this would allow us to ensure, for example, that A reads the data from the sensor, B does the control calculation, C sends the signal to the actuator. And because we can control the offsets in this way, we can determine the order in which the tasks are run each time uh, we go through the array. And we do all of this. The key thing with this is, this is the scheduler code. You don't change that code. You never need to change that code. You work in main. And your interface to the system, you might end up with 50 calls to the add task function at the start of main, adding all of these tasks. But they're all now documented. So they know I will say, I'm running this task, I know I'm running it every 30 ticks, and I know I've got this initial offset, and a part of the design process, which we're not going to do in enough detail in this module for to do very much with it, come back from module A2, and we'll talk about how you determine these parameters, because it's not a trivial process for a uh, uh, number of tasks. But, so you have to determine these, and that will be a significant part of the design process, but you'll end up then with a main function 
that documents this and you've separated out the tasks from the schedule. Now suppose B overruns now. What's going to happen? Okay, so B over, ignoring the offset for a moment, what's going to happen if B overruns in these circumstances? What's going to happen to that function on the screen? It'll still run. It'll still run. The difference here, we've done one, we've done one very small change, which is to take, there's nothing particularly magical about this implementation of the code. It's just a possible implementation of a TTC schedule. What we've done here, the only significant change we've done here in terms of the operation of the system is we've separated the dispatching of the tasks and keeping track of time. And because we've done that, because we dispatch the tasks here, we can interrupt. So the tasks, all the tasks are called from this function within main. And now that means that this timer ISR can interrupt this. So if a task overran temporarily, uh, so we estimated the worst case execution time would be 10 milliseconds. Every three hours, it, it has a 20 millisecond run. Assuming we've, not, we've got spare capacity in our system and that's not a catastrophic failure, which it might be, but if it's not a catastrophic failure, what this does is this adds another tick to the tick count. And if you look at the way that the dispatch function then works, it doesn't say tick count is equal to zero. It decrements the tick count. So if the tick count, if this has been blocked for 100 ticks by a task overrunning, this thing will keep track of that. And what you'll do is you'll just keep going around this loop, dispatching the tasks until there are no ticks left to run. So you'll catch up. So uh, the behavior is well defined. You've, got, you've now got some recovery behavior in this system, which is easy to understand. You know that the tasks will run in the required order uh, in this system, and you know that it will catch up when uh, you separate the two parts so of the design. Stops, going, C, will run when it C will definitely run when it stops. Uh, and you can control the order in which the tasks are run by adapting the way the dispatcher function runs, should that be an important consideration for you. This one basically, what's the highest priority task in this system? The first one, yeah. And that's the assumption made in this design. So it starts at the top of the array and goes down. So in this case, if A was added first, A would be the highest priority task uh, in the system implicitly. So that means, it doesn't mean A interrupts anything else. What it means is when the system makes a scheduling decision, once it starts the dispatch function, the first thing it tries to run is A, if A is due to run, and then it worries about running anything else. And that could be running multiple tasks within one tick. Typical for the kind of systems we work on, there will typically be around about eight tasks in a tick. Uh, and you're determining the order in which those tasks are going to run through this process. The schedule goes to sleep in just the same way as before. Why on earth do we need this? Okay, um, we've just got, we've got a small amount to do just to wrap up this morning's um, session. So we've looked a little bit about the impact of jitter in real-time systems and some of the implications of moving to a 32-bit processor, including all the useful things you get in terms of additional peripheral support and very briefly, some of the uh, implications of uh, use of JTAG. Uh, and we've looked at a simple TTC scheduler. So just look at two final components here and then uh, uh, very quickly at the way you can run some of these things on an x86 platform if you want to do so. Watchdog timers. Have you used a watchdog?
How many of you have used a watchdog time? What does a watchdog do? Okay, and it does that like this. Uh, you want to burgle a house, you take an accomplice with you. The, the house has a guard dog. You want to burgle a house, you take a large bag of meat with you, your accomplice stands at the front of the house and throws the dog a piece of meat. It takes the dog about three seconds to eat that piece of meat. You then have about another two seconds to throw him another piece of meat or the dog will start barking. And you go through that process, throwing a dog a piece of meat roughly every five seconds. As long as you keep feeding the dog meat, it won't bark. The homeowners don't wake up and you can burgle the house. That's the watchdog analogy. There is an equivalent in uh, embedded systems. An external device, an external timer, and you have to feed it um, every uh, period, uh, after a known period, say every five milliseconds. You have to update that external watchdog timer, send it, and send it something every five milliseconds. So send it an update command every five milliseconds. Say. If you don't do that, then typically the watchdog timer will reset your system. There's a crucial bit here. You need to have this. If you're going to have a watchdog, you must have this capability. Why? Yep. If you don't have that, what's the worst case scenario? You get the same problem again. So if you don't, if you can't determine, so you're seven miles above the ground, your system has a problem, the watchdog resets it, uh, your plane basically tumbles a few hundred feet while the system resets, because while it's resetting, you have no control. A few milliseconds later, has the same problem again, watchdog resets it. You tumble another few hundred feet while it resets the process, and that process happens with the inevitable consequences at the end of it. You need to be able to determine what happened, what caused the watchdog reset. There are lots of other mechanisms you can use. For example, timeout behavior around peripherals, the kind of things we looked at yesterday, which you should use first. This needs to be a last resort. As a general rule, we'd suggest you only use watchdogs Watchdogs become what you do if the system has failed and you don't know why. And typically, the only sensible behavior, if you turn this thing on, check the watchdog reset, if the system was reset by the watchdog, you fail it silently. So you shut it down and try and leave the system in a state where it won't do any damage. And that's typical behavior for this. So if it's a control, if it's an aircraft control, you try and get the relevant part of the control surfaces into a neutral position, etc. Uh, so that's generally the use for watchdog timers. Can be useful, sometimes seen as the only uh, option for error recovery. Can be very dangerous if uh, not used correctly. Uh, Sometimes one of the problems with watchdog timers is that the timing resolution isn't very fine. On modern uh, microcontrollers, and again, back to our same example, on modern microcontrollers, you can get very fine control uh, with a watchdog timer. What might we do here with a watchdog? Yep, so let's say that's 10 milliseconds. How do we refresh the watchdog? Okay, so so how, what are we going to do to issue the refresh watchdog instruction? Okay, and we're going to do that in task W. Okay, and task W is going to run in every tick, and it's going to be the lowest priority task in every tick. So it's going to run in every tick after every other task has run. Um, watchdog will be set to something like 11 milliseconds. 
And as long as that task runs at the right time, um, we're OK. If that task overruns, then the watchdog will be tripped. And you can decide 11 milliseconds or 15 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds, depending on how much flexibility you want to allow in the system and how much scope for overruns uh, you want to allow. So you can use it quite happily. In this way, it's a, so it's a form of task guardian. It's a way of dealing with a situation that a task has overrun in a manner that you didn't expect. So you, you know what the worst case execution time is here. It should never exceed that. Use the watchdog to trap the situations when it does exceed that because it means something catastrophic has happened in your design. One final bit of general design. Yesterday, looking at a few people were asking questions about the exercise yesterday, the first thing I was looking for, which of course was difficult for you to implement, was this, a heartbeat LED. Every embedded system, almost without exception, should have a heartbeat LED. So it should have an LED that flashes on and off at whatever your chosen rate is. Ours are typically running at uh, half a hertz. They flash on and off uh, at half a hertz. You have a simple task in your system that does this. Once you've looked at 100 of these, you can tell very quickly, even if the oscillator frequency is a little bit out, um, it's, that thing seems to be running quickly or it's not running at all. I don't need to connect a JTAG interface to it. So we open up the top of the anti-lock braking system. We look inside there. We turn the power on the vehicle. There should be deep inside, under a little cap or something, or a little LED flashing on and off. And we say, OK, I don't need to connect that one up. That one seems to be OK. Let's see where the problem now lies. It can save you an enormous amount of effort. It's very cheap. It takes you one task and a few lines of code. Please put a heartbeat LED on your systems. It's the most useful debugging aid. Um, what happens if your hard disk fails on a, a laptop, on your laptop? Are you very fortunate people? <laughs> what do you get? So the hard disk fails, it can't boot the operating system. Sorry? But do you, what do you hear? Beep, 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 gap. Beep, 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 gap. And that's main hard disk failure. That's another variation on this. Uh, you can make it beep. That's fine in some applications, obviously infuriating in others. You can beep in some applications, but you can, you can use this as an error LED is another way you can use it. So essentially, off three quick uh, flashes, off. Three quick flashes means lost communication with the main node. Five quick flashes means a GPS unit is not responding to instruction, etc. Again, don't need to connect the JTAG. This is going to tell me, and it can tell me very easily. Uh, it's the simplest way of getting some of this useful information out. Finally, before we let you play with some of the hardware, just want to run quickly through how you can take some of these things and run them on uh, an embedded PC. Uh, any idea how much a motherboard, an uh, Intel Atom based motherboard will cost you? Fifty quid. About fifty pounds buys you one of these. Uh, not much money. You buy an ARM 7 based evaluation board, it'll cost you probably uh, that much or more. One of these, because they're produced in such high volumes, these are very cost effective. There are lots and lots of bits to shake off on here, so you're not going to want to use it in all application areas. It's also, uh, in comparison with um, a smaller embedded board, needs the equivalent of a nuclear reactor to power it in comparison, so it's not going to be ideal for battery powered applications, but it's very powerful and it's cost effective. Um, and we know a number of people that use these in a number of application areas. It can be very effective. Uh, we know people who are using these kind of designs in medical systems, uh, running Linux on them, using in medical systems, still wanting high integrity from it. Um, so how can you use these for the kinds of designs we've been looking at so far? Uh, 
one way of first thing we need to do if you're going to use one of these boards to run something like a TTC scheduler is you need to be able to boot the board. If you want to do this, um, get one of the Linux bootloaders and use that as a starting point. Uh, we can give you some example if you want to do this. Uh, Sys Linux or something gives you a bootloader that will boot this kind of board up quite happily and then you can treat it, uh, then you've got the board booted up, you can then start running uh, uh, standard code on this system. We need somewhere to get I.O. Oops. Uh, that's one simple option for I.O. The LPT1 uh, port, which is um, line, yeah, line print terminal 1, it originally used to be. You can use this to give you an I.O. connection, simplest form of I.O. connection on these kind of boards, if you want to do so. Um, still don't know why I did that. Uh, so that's what the output of this gives you. It gives you a number of potential input and output pins on this board. You get less I.O., less simple digital I.O. on an embedded PC platform than you do on an 8051 microcontroller, but you've got a lot of processor power, and you can just treat these as standard input-output pins and control them in pretty much the same way that you did uh, in the examples you ran yesterday. Um, so we can give you a demo of the system running on this if you want to see it. But you can happily take even these high-end uh, platforms and run the kind of uh, and run these using the kind of simple architectures that we've used uh, in the course of the last couple of days. So that's what we've done this morning. You should all have exercise three. What we're going to do now is uh, give you uh, hand out some Altera boards and let you get started on the next exercise. Thank you.